Hello and welcome to the Admin Bar, the community that helps you streamline your process, sharpen your skills, and demand higher paying projects. Today is April 9th of 2019, and this episode number 24 is titled, What You Need Is A System, with our good pal, Jim Galliano. My name is Kyle Van Dusen from Ogle Web Design, just outside of Fort Worth, Texas. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Matt Siebert from Matthew Siebert Design. How is it going today, Matt? Wonderful, Kyle. Thanks for asking. Everybody in the comments seems to be really, or the comments here is talking about your beard. I mean, it's just one, but I'm going to say everybody. <laughs> yeah, it makes me feel a little bit better. It's, it's, it's patchy. So it, uh, you know, just the, the words of support really, it means a lot. Thank you. Guys. <laughs> Every, everybody leave your beard comments for Matt. Yeah. He needs our, he needs our help today. And uh, of course, we have Jim with us today. But before we say hello and get... Uh, Diving into our topic at hand, I did want to mention next week, we are going to have Matt Davies, who's one of my favorite people on the internet, uh, on the show for the first time, and I'm super excited about that. He has uh, what I think is a a mind-blowingly awesome project that he's going to be launching the day we have the show. So you're going to want to be there for that, um, because it will be your first look at it. So stick around next week for that. Uh, Also here in the last week or so, we launched a cool little uh, page hero design system for Elementor. It's called the Foolproof Page Hero. You can get to it by going to theadminbar.com forward slash foolproof, all one word, F-O-O-L-P-R-O-O-F. And uh, I actually think Jim is one of the purchasers of that. So uh, I love it. Yeah, look at that feedback yeah. right on the spot. We didn't even pay him for that. In fact, no. I tried to give it to him for free and he paid for it anyways. <laughs> yeah, you have to support the admin bar. Everybody's getting all the good information for free and it, the ideas, so why not? Cut that out, Matt, and let's make that a promo. You got it. I like <laughs> it. All right, well, let's get going and talk with Jim. If, if you're not familiar with Jim, he runs a podcast at jimgalliano.com. And for me, it is an absolute must listen every week. I think I harass him every time he emails me. I write him back. I bug him. Uh, I found him several months back, and I went on a total binge listening spree of every episode he's ever done, some of them multiple times. And I think uh, part of my uh, infatuation is I'm a very hyper spastic uh, into everything kind of person. And Jim is so smooth and relaxing and calm and can uh, really <laughs> help me uh, cut all these things out of my mind. So if you haven't checked out his podcast, you can go to jimgalliano.com. We'll put links in the show notes. And uh, Jim, other than that little bit of an introduction, why don't you tell everybody about yourself? Well, uh, first, thanks for having me on here again. Uh, I got started in this business back in 1998, so that was quite a, a number of years ago. And like many people, I kind of um, failed forward. I tested a lot of things out. And uh, what I noticed was about every five years, I was having to reinvent what I was doing because the markets changed, people uh, changed, things are interested in. All those things changed with regularity. So this time, uh, I decided when the, when the next transformation period comes and I have to redo what I'm doing to stay relevant, I want to have a business model that is going to take me out through the rest of my career, one that can be adjusted simply, one that's less stress, and one that has the the less moving parts. And so that's that's what I built, and uh, that's what I've tested on myself. And now uh, a lot of my clients, brick-and-mortar people, people who are freelancers and agency runners, uh, they're finding this model to be better suited for what they're, you know, what's on their plate and what they have to deal with and in, in their markets. So it's, it's been exciting to be able to share uh, this with people. And uh, yeah, so that's my, that's my backstory. Awesome. Well, you, you do talk about the uh, less moving parts thing. That's an overarching theme uh, throughout all the podcast episodes. And it's one that uh, gets stuck in my head when I'm trying to make things super complicated that I need to think about that. So kind of what led you to that phrase and that philosophy? And can you tell us a little bit more about what less moving parts really means in a business? Well, in, in, a, in a general sense, uh, when you have less things to focus on, you have less stress. I mean, just think of a, of a busy week compared to a non-busy week, just in life. The more things you have to remember, the more stress there is, the more potential anxiety there is. When you have a, uh, a bigger business and you have a lot of people that you have to deal with, personalities and, and individual uh, quirks, it creates another kind of stress. 
And so the less moving parts approach is, can we be as profitable or even more profitable without all those external things, without all the extra people, and without the long to-do lists? And so um, we like to believe that's true, but deep down inside, we're trained that just the opposite is true. We're taught to buy. We're taught deadlines. We're taught to-do lists. We're taught productivity. And so it takes a lot of pushing against the, uh, you know, the popular methods of today to get to that point where you can actually believe it. And, and you have to believe it because if you don't, it's kind of like saying, you know, I got to meet with a client uh, this afternoon and I just don't think he or she is going to buy, uh, you know, an expensive plan. And you kind of talk yourself out of it. And then when you get there, you almost feel, oh, yeah, I was and I was right. You know, so we kind of like become what we believe you know, if we believe we can make it here, then we, we do the things necessary to make it here. If we, if we don't believe we can, then we kind of get comfortable with where we are. So, you know, we only come by this way one time. And uh, I, I just determined that man, I've got to make this work because I got into this business to get out of the corporate world, to get freedom. And then I started realizing I was building the very thing I was trying to get away from over the years. Right. You, you know, so. That's what the less moving parts approach is. Yeah, that's like that's a uh, that's a mind shift too, because you know, for me at least, um, this year is so far better than last year, and last year was better than the the previous year. However, you know, since I've started putting things into uh, into categories and starting to to lessen. <clears throat> excuse me, lesson like, you know, the, uh, not the workload, but just make sure that everything is in a system. I am less stressed. And over the last nine years of doing this, um, I have been stressed and I have had like a lot of work coming in and in my mind, and I'm sure it's the same with a lot of other people is that stress equals success. You know, it's, it's, if I'm not stressed out, if I don't have a ton of work coming in, then I'm not doing, you know, what I should be doing. But have you ever gotten stressed because around. you're not stressed? You know what I'm saying? Like you, you feel stressed because you're not stressing out. Like what's wrong? What am I not doing? Yeah. You know? And actually last week I called Kyle and I was like, man, I'm, I'm kind of coming down on myself because although in open projects, I have far more than, you know, last year at this time, uh, I'm not stressed out. I'm not, you know, it, I have a, a bit more downtime. I have this and that. And Kyle's like, well, yeah, because you're doing it right now. You know, you're, you've you've put things into a system. Like, it's not it's not necessarily an issue. Yeah, that's yeah excellent. I, think, I think that was exactly it, though. You're just so like you're so hardwired to feel that pressure that when you don't have it, it's an odd feeling. And I think like something scary about our business too is how fast things change. So you know, Jim talked about kind of having to reinvent things, you know, every couple of years and stuff. So you mentioned in kind of your intro here about a system that's easily a adaptable to those, you know, this ever changing environment. So what's the secret to making something that's, uh, that can easily adapt through these changes? Well, the first thing was the realization that people saw me as an individual, not a, as a corporation or as a company, they were doing business with me. And so I put a lot of energy into getting the business name out there but I was competing with people that had these huge advertising budgets and these big overheads. And it was kind of like, uh, you know, a middleweight trying to compete with heavyweights. And the more I tried, the, the harder the, it, uh, the struggle was. So I had to realize I have, you have to fight in your own weight division, right? That's why there's multiple weight divisions. So, you know, you and I aren't doing web uh, design for AT&T. And there's a reason why we're not doing it for them. We're doing it for a different type of company. So once we recognize where our strengths are and more importantly, where they aren't, then we can start building around them. So I came from a, uh, a family with a lot of personalities, I call them. You know, everybody, uh, you know, knew my dad back in the day. He's retired now, so he's not as out there in the public, but everybody knew him. My grandfather was a boxing hall of fame uh, person and uh, a bookie for the North Police Department back in the day. So everybody knew who he was. And I was around all these famous people growing up and they had these larger than life personalities. And I thought I would like to be that way, but I'm shy. And, you know, I would mumble when I talked and I was afraid to, you know, step out into the spotlight. And so when I started a business, I kind of channeled my dad. <laughs> like I, I started like talking louder when I was in public. 
I started not being afraid to be the first person to jump into the line when the new register opens, whereas before I'd be kind of like timid. And I all went right. through all this in my in my 20s. Um, I, you know, I didn't real. I was afraid to talk to the girl, you know, the pretty girl back in the day. So um, I remember once when I was in school, this is kind of funny, but I bought a ticket to give to the girl to go to the dance with me. And I mumbled so low that she said to her friend, you know, Jim bought me a ticket for the dance, I think. He mumbled something. I don't even know what he said. <laughs> and then he walked away. <laughs> Smooth. <laughs> so, yeah, I had to overcome all of those things. And the only way you overcome is by practice. So when I started realizing that, hey, you know what? People can like me for me. I'm laid back. But that doesn't mean that I have to, like, like be in a meek voice. You know, I can talk and, and feel comfortable. And I became more comfortable with myself. And then when I realized the more, being more comfortable with myself made other people more comfortable with me, I started getting out there. But I wasn't a salesperson. But the interesting thing was people weren't buying things from me because I was a salesperson. They were buying things because they were comfortable with me. You know? And what we're taught in this uh, field is, and, and if you think about how agencies have been run in the past, the big ones, um, they have salespeople. It's a profession. They have graphic designers and coders, their professions. They have photographers. Imagine if you uh, told the, the designers and the coders and everything in the big agency, hey, you have to go out and sell the services also, right? But that's basically what we've done. We, we've tried to become multiple professions, and it just doesn't work that way. And so rather than try to become something you're not, a salesperson, uh, the advantage that we have is that we know these topics inside out. And we know the benefits that they bring to people. The disadvantages that we have is that we're too much into the geek speak. We don't talk in terms that the average person can understand because we, we're not used to that. Once you get used to that and you begin to take the definitions and the terms and replace them with just things that people can relate to, then everything changes. It's kind of like you wrote a, an article on the admin bar um, that I was reading the other day. It was a really good article because you were talking about the value that you brought to different clients and you gave an example of three different clients, right? So um, that happened because you began a conversation and through that conversation, you found out what was valuable and what wasn't. And then you became that to those people. You became the guy that, okay, this person is going to need, uh, they do their fundraising at this time of the year. They have their events. They're going to need more focus at that time than they are the rest of the year. And that's fine. The other person needed security with the website. <clears throat> That's things that we can only do in real interactions. It's people talking to people. So when I, just, when I realized that, hey, that's what's really growing my business. It's not ads. It's not my sales copy. It's that people feel comfortable with me. They know that I understand them because when they talk, I'm repeating back to them what they said to make sure we're on the same page. And almost nobody's doing that. What people are doing is they're waiting for somebody to stop talking so they can start talking. So, I mean, isn't that true? Yeah, oh, absolutely. All of it, you know, we're like, oh, man, I got one chance to impress this person. So what's the natural thing for me to do? I've been doing this for 20-something years. Nobody cares. Right. Or maybe, maybe some people care, but really not. You know, oh, I was interviewed by NBC News. I was interviewed by the Wall Street Journal. Oh, uh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> None right. of that closes the sale. You know, it just tells you that you're competent. But there's millions of other people that are, well, maybe not millions, but there's a lot of other people that were interviewed by whoever, you know. So at the end of the day, it's you and I talking to each other. So I had to duplicate that. And what I did was I created a uh, system that would take all of these parts, sales, marketing, and communication and put them into one simple duplicatable package. And I made it simple enough where people can understand it. But the real um, key is being able to work with the individual so they're comfortable with it. Instead of just, hey, here's a bunch of information. You know, I could give you a bunch of law books and say, Here, here's all the books you need to become a lawyer. You know, just dig in. Right. You know, work your way through it. So... And I think it's funny you mentioned that blog post because I think uh, that's probably subconsciously a product of listening to you now that you uh, kind of tie these two things together, you know, and, and my whole point with it, and I, ha I had a couple of people follow up with me, uh, kind of like needing clarification on it. And I was like, you know, my whole point was I can list out a ton of different features 
that come with the care plan. But the, the truth is customers don't give two shits about 90% of those, 99% of them. They probably have one or maybe two things that matter to them. If I know what those one or two things are, I can sell this to them all day long because I can alleviate those fears for them. Like these listing out a hundred things isn't going to do anything. It's just about finding out what that person needs. And, and kind of what you're describing here is like that more personal approach to getting to know what that customer needs and, 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 uh, you know, how you, how you can be the service provider that takes care of that for them, not how you can be the big, fancy, shiny object. Yeah. And, you know, at that point, it's not even selling necessarily. It's just, it's taking their, their pain points and fixing it. Like that's, that's yeah. all you're doing. Yeah. That's perfectly put. Yeah. And perfectly. when you can, when you can solve a problem for somebody, they're more than happy to pay for that. You know, I think that's just how things work. You know, you don't have to sell it. You just have to say, oh, I can help you with that. You know, and then exactly. And, and if I came here and I thought, well, you know, I got to I got to sell Kyle and Matt today on my new um, course or book or, or uh, on my design services or on my hosting services or on my email. I got to sell that, which means I got to impress them. Right. Which means I got to get value. And what I'm doing is I'm putting myself in a position now where I have to force myself to become a you know what I'm saying? And you'll you'll sense it. You'll oh, sense yeah. that I'm trying to force it. And what happens? A wall goes up, right? And you're smiling and you're nodding, but you know that credit card isn't coming out anytime soon, you know. And so the thing is, we all need to buy things to solve problems. We all want to buy things that that we enjoy that make life better, easier, uh, whatever, taste better. And um, and so we're going to do that, but we don't want to feel pushed or coerced into it. We want to believe that we've made the decisions to make those purchases. And see, what happens is um, think about some of the lists that you were on in the past that you're not on anymore. And when people push you to buy something, and maybe you buy it because there's a deadline or something like that, at the end, you, you kind of resent it a little bit. You know, I think, um, well, I, don't, I was going to name a service, but I'm not going to name it now, just in case. <laughs> but, you know, it's one we're familiar with where they're always like pushing something new. There's always a deadline. And, and, and what happens is you burn a lot of bridges that way. Whereas when you're uh, real, you know, and you're just yourself and you know what you can do and what you can't do, then there's no need to be a good actor. There's no need to try and figure out how can I influence Kyle and Matt today? There's none of that, you know, because if I'm not a good fit for you, then I don't want you to have buyer's remorse and be thinking, oh, man, I bought all of his books. I bought all of his, you know, I have his hosting plan. And am I really getting what I'm paying for, you know? I, and we've all done it. Yeah. You know, I bought things. I'm like, what, what was I thinking? Was I, I think I was going to buy my way into like a higher income bracket by getting that <laughs> software. <laughs> you know, you know? I think we all know exactly what company you're talking about. <laughs> um, but yeah. So one thing you, you've talked about, um, several times in your podcast. And I know you, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this as well as you have a workshop out right now that people can get into, but you have kind of a unique approach that that's part of this system, I imagine, of how you kind of do some prospecting and some initial conversations with with uh, with finding customers. So I ran a poll in our group the other day and asked people like how how they uh, how they market their company, how they find new business. And my my intention was to before today, which I didn't do, damn it, uh, was to kind of categorize those and say which ones of these are proactive and which one of these are reactive. Yeah. And, I knew my hypothesis would be right. And it was that most of them were very reactive type things. And at the same time, we have people saying, how do I get more sales? How do I sell more stuff? How do you know? So the problem is they're not getting sales, but the things that they're doing are very reactive and not proactive. And the approach that you have to doing this is extremely proactive and really, really easy to do. So why don't you tell us all a little bit about that? Yeah, well, you know what? Um, sometimes I'll meet people locally and then I'll look them up online. I'll find their websites. Other times, you know, their website will just come up and because I'm looking for certain people that might need what I have. And so basically all I do is I create these short little videos and uh, they're like little commercials, but they're not. I say commercials because a commercial is 30 seconds. A long commercial would be a minute and you can say a lot in 30 seconds getting right to the point. And so what I do is I find things about their business or their site or how they're approaching something that could be improved a little bit and made even better or more effective. 
which I can imagine you can go to like any website and find something, right? You know, most of the websites you go to, you're going to be able to find something. Yeah, you'll be able to find something. And, and you know, you don't want to say, you know, your design is just wrist cutting bad. You know, you don't right. want to say anything like that because the guy's or daughter's son, whatever, may, may have made it or nephew or something. So, um, you know, you just say where there's room for improvement. You say what you like and you say where there's room for improvement uh, in a short video. And then you send them an email. And what I do is I introduce myself quickly. Uh, Hi, my name is Jim. I was at your website the other day and I, I know I noticed this or I might say I'm a local business person or I got your your in other words, I keep it very short and to the point. I don't even make it like a formula. You know, I understand why people use templates. It's like saying, hey, if you want to uh, introduce yourself to someone, this is how you do it. You look them in the eye and you smile and you shake their hand and you say, hi, I'm, you know, right. And there's things that you don't do. You know, like you don't act like an idiot, <laughs> but, uh, you know, all that aside. So I send these little videos out and start the conversation that way. And, uh, and it's a great way to do it. And I started doing this with my clients. <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll go to the site because, you know, I'm hosting it or updating it or whatever. I don't always design it. Maybe I got it from somebody else. They moved over to me and I'll create little videos that say, Hey, look, this is what I noticed. Most of your traffic is coming from from here and we have an opportunity to do this you know create an event on facebook or send an email out i focus a lot on email um because the open rates compared to um uh, people seeing a post on social media there's a huge difference and email is a uh is a, just a very effective way to communicate with people you know so you don't have to use it to sell people you can just use it to keep the conversation going you know, and then when people need what you have. So right now, basically, I create a podcast um, and I talk maybe an hour a week. And that's really the extent of my content creation. And the people that don't even are in, interested in my type of business, they see the podcast, and they listen to it and they're like, oh, you know, I mean, you're talking about business. I could really relate to something that you said. And, and that is my marketing and, and sales all into that one activity, you know, so I have a lot of time to do other things. Yeah. And I think, I think you said too, that you probably have like hundreds of those videos that you've created oh, unlisted on your YouTube channel, huh? Unlisted. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that whole process, which I think is a very like proactive way to go find clients. It's super easy to do because like I said, almost any website you go to, you can, you can find problems with it. You can easily prospect the types of clients you want to look for. So if you're saying, hey, I'm looking for this industry or I'm looking for a company that's of this size. Uh, so it's really easy for you to figure out exactly who you want to go after. And how long does it typically take you to, once you've found a website, to, to put all this together and press send on the email? What is that investment usually like? Well, I, I use Camtasia Studio just because I'm used to it. And what's great about Camtasia, um, you know, if your hair doesn't look cool, like like Matt's does, if it kind of looks like mine where it needs to be cut and there's gray coming in, I put myself as a little stamp on the bottom. You know, I'm just in the little box so they can sure. see me talking. But the rest is me sharing the screen. Right. And, uh, and I'll go and I'll show them the site. And uh, it takes about, I don't know, 10 minutes to, to do that. That's, that's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's nothing. I said yeah. that is unlisted. Yeah, you have the link there and you just... And then you send it out. You can almost gamify it. <clears throat> you, ju you just say, okay, this week I'm going to find five sites and send it out. Here's the thing you got to realize. I know this is hard for somebody to believe if you haven't been through this process before, but um, the people that you're sending, nobody's going to show up at your door and work you over because you sent a contact to somebody. You're right. You don't, nobody's going to come and eat you. you. There's nothing to be afraid of. All you're mm -hmm. doing is creating your video to help them. That's it. You're just showing a few a few points and inviting them to contact you back again. So you might say, well, this week I'm going to do that with five businesses. right? So you might start out with, I want to start with people that I kind of sort of know a little bit and start with, hey, here's an idea how we can make your site. And then you become a little more comfortable. Then you contact somebody that you, you don't know. But think about it. There's people that you don't know who are listening to this podcast right now. There's people that you don't know watching your videos. You don't get all uptight when you're when you're making them thinking, wow, there's going to be people I don't know, you know, you're, you're just, uh, and, and so it's, it's like a mind thing. It's a lot of this is, is mental. And that's, and I, 
Yeah, go ahead. I think a lot of people like, you know, you talked about being shy when you were younger. I think that's a lot of people's problem with like people have been doing the sales method forever in person, walking up to a business and trying to have this conversation. I'm not a shy person, but that's even hard for me to just walk into a business or or even cold call and pick up a phone. But this method is there's so much less friction involved because you kind of pre-produce everything. Yeah. And then send it off and you can't judge that you can't see their reaction. So you're not feeling that judgment, you know, yeah. as they're as they're looking at it. And I'm sure that's helpful too. Yeah, and it's a little bit more on their terms too, because if you just walk into a business, I mean, you don't know what they're doing that day. You don't know how they're bu- you know, how busy they are. You don't know if the managers, you know, or the 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 person that you need to speak to is going to be there. You know, there's so much up in the air. But if you send a video, they can watch it when they have a, a bit of downtime. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And who likes it when somebody walks into your business and disrupts you, you know, but, you know, on the counter end of this, if I get an email and I don't want it, no, I just hit delete. And then I go on about my day and I'm not mad at anybody. You know what I mean? So I think that's a, I follow up one time. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. I just follow up one time to let them know that I send it out and, um, and you know it takes a little more to do do that, but sometimes people lose an email or delete it by accident or don't sure. see it. Mm-hmm. You know, so I do follow up one time uh, within about a week. So, what do you think your um, your response rate is to that? I mean, even if it's not, hey, I want to hire you right now. Like, how often does that start a conversation? <sighs> it's really hard to tell because I do it so often. I've never really kept track of it. This is kind of like a lifestyle, you know, you meet people, you tell them what you do, you, you know, you invite them. I mean, like I do a lot of this locally. So um, I would say that being that it's my only advertising method uh, that I do, I would say that if I had to give, I would say about 8%. So, so 8% in mail order is like a great response. So I would say about 8% of the people respond within two weeks the rest of the people nobody ever forgets you nobody ever forget especially if you send that second one out they all remember i've people gotten back to me like six months down the line eight months down because we're talking about services that we sell that aren't like you know 20 30 bucks you know they're more so you have to be in the market for that kind of service so between that and um you know, just when people come to your site, they see your videos and stuff like that. Those two things working together is basically all you need, you know, because they'll also create that. It'll create that referral system. So the referral system is kind of automatically baked into that. So basically, like if you did an admin bar for the people just in your town, talk about the same topics, but use different definitions and words, you know. Um, you would have the same type of audience that you do on the admin bar on Facebook. It's, so it's the same message, but it's two different audiences. So the, the vernacular changes a little bit. Sure. And the nice thing about the local audience is they don't want to sit and listen to any more than five minutes anyway of anything. Yeah. I don't even think the people on the show want to listen to me for more than five minutes. So that <laughs> just might just be a general rule. <laughs> so so let's, uh, I, I did go through your workshop actually several times now, uh, stalker territory. Um, but one thing I wanted to talk about was kind of pricing. So that's one thing uh, you you have some information on is, and one thing that I think we've all kind of run into is, you know, it's really good when you can get an idea of a customer's budget, but you can't always get them nailed down on that. I think most of the time when I ask people their budget, they say they don't know. Uh, and yeah. they do know they're just, they don't want to give me that information. We're kind of playing this game. So you have a, a system you use to kind of lessen that risk of sending that in, you know, that proposal out and it being way off track. And that could be lower or higher. I've sent out proposals that were way too low and I could have got a lot more for. And I've sent out ones that were just way overly complicated for what they need and didn't get the job in either case because I wasn't in that right spot. So what kind of, a, what kind of part of your system combats that? Well, there's two parts to it. There's the small, medium, and large approach. Okay, so you have to figure... If you're talking about like a spa site or a small store or a restaurant, they have small, medium, and large um, versions of that, just like with cars. You know, we have cheap cars, we have mid-range cars, and we have very expensive cars. So basically what you do is you create your pricing to match that industry, small, medium, and large, low, mid-range, high. And that way, those numbers are already there and present. 
because you got people that will never buy expensive, never, 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 never. And even though they have the money to do it, and then you have people that will never buy cheap. Then you got people like me who are always looking for right in the middle. I don't want cheap and I feel like I'm wasting money if I spend too much. So I'm the middle buyer with everything across the line. So you might create a small, medium, and large pricing for restaurants, small, medium, and large pricing for spas, and so on. And you have those prices set out. And that way, when you present that with to somebody, they have a choice. And choice always creates that extra bit of comfort. You don't feel like you're being coerced. If you came in too high, you don't have to worry about it because you got two other shots to hit the ball. You have your medium and you have your low. So that's one way of pricing. The other way of pricing that I do is the value pricing. And how, what that's based on is we want to determine what in type of improvement percentage-wise will this job potentially create. Potentially is the, is the key there. So, like, for example, we might say, all right, let's do an advertisement to um, get more people into the admin bar. Let, let's create a, an ad for that. So how many people do you think we can get more? What, what Like, say so there's like 2,000 people here now or something. Let's say we want to get, like, another 500. What would that mean for the business money-wise? Right. So we work in percentages. A hundred dollars is a better way to put it. Okay. So if each client is worth a hundred dollars, what would a, um, a, and you get like a thousand people to the, to the site and out of that thousand, 10% buy, right. What would happen if we got an extra 500 people to the site? What would that mean to your bottom line? And so that's what you're basically selling. You're selling the percentage of income increase based on your site working, your mail campaign work, whatever it is you're selling, your new design, whatever. And so that takes it out of, you know, how much time do you, are you going to spend on this? I don't want to give you $5,000 if it's only going to take you two hours to do it. Instead, we're selling what this thing will do to your bottom line as a result of having it. So uh, an easy percentage is I, I start with 3 to 5%, let's say. What would a 3 or 5% increase to your bottom line mean? So if you're you know, the person does the math. If you're bad at math, you bring a calculator with you and just do the addition right in front of them. Right now, if it takes them four months to pay your website off, it's worth it because after four months, then look at how much more income they're going to have. Yeah. Right. And positioning it that way too, you know, it, it's much more or it's much less a, uh, a cost or an expenditure and much more of an investment. Yeah. Now, the, why do I have both? Why not just settle on one? Because there are certain people, you got to remember that a successful business person, they're used to every sales method out there already. And so you've got people who already know that, okay, they're hitting me with the value argument. I already have a response to that. Guess what? We paid 10 grand. We paid 20 grand for the last website and it didn't do it. They told us it was going to do this, this, this. It didn't do any of those things. So forget about that. You know, so then if, if, you know, if you face somebody with that approach, it's almost like saying this fighter, when you fight them, has a tremendous left hook. Their right hand is average, but you've got to have a plan to avoid getting hit with that shot. So that's how they look at salespeople. They look at how they got hit in the past. You know, that's why some people don't want to buy uh, certain types of services anymore because they had a bad, you know, there's nothing we can do about that. Yeah. But you know, if, if you do the value pricing and it's not working with somebody, then you always had the small, medium, and large to fall back on. So have you found any kind of, uh, do you have any kind of indicators that tell you which one you're going to go in with? Like, is there a certain type of industry or a certain type of person where you know you're going to go with one or the other? Well, you know, um, it's interesting because like the the car industry, when I got started with uh, those type of websites back in the 90s, they paid like three times what everybody else paid, you know? So back in the nineties, like with just one account, I was probably making about $400 a month just to send emails out for them. You know, you're not going to get that with a restaurant or with the hot dog vendor, <laughs> you know, there's just, there's just not enough profit. So high cost industry examples of people who have more money are the, um, you know, of course the car industry, you know, um, I, w I don't even put attorneys in there because there's a lot of poor lawyers out there. I think most, lawyers are poor actually yeah yeah it's just an overcrowded field but uh the furniture industry uh the cosmetic industry these are our industries where you know the the clients are used to paying a lot of money they pay you know it's just where they pay all up front or they pay you know gradually um 
those are the where you can sell the value a little bit easier than you can in like the restaurant business. Now, some restaurants are um, really done well. You know, they've got deeper pockets, and and you can do you can charge a little bit more for those kind, especially the kind that you know they're going to franchise out, even local franchises. You know, I have some clients that do that. So, so yeah, I mean, it becomes like one of those things where it's easier if you start out doing one with one type of, of business and and figure out how it works. But, you know, one of the things I tried to niche when I first started in this and it just didn't work out for me. I, I was getting businesses, you know, one in this industry, one in this industry, one in that industry. And uh, when I finally figured out what it was that was causing them to say yes and why I couldn't get the others, it was because I had more time to interact with the individuals. The other individuals weren't in the market. They didn't want to start the conversation. You know, so timing has a lot to do with it. But the nice thing about it, like I said in that workshop, when you have a content creation plan that's consistent, then then you're okay because you're not going to be out of sight, out of mind. You know, they're going to see that you, you're going to always show up, um, and and you you will out of sight, out of mind is just a this is a kiss of death. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things, too, when you build up that catalog of content, um, they don't your prospect doesn't even have to read, listen, watch any of it. They just see that it exists and it already instills that confidence. So the only way you get to the point where you have that catalog of, of content is to start producing it now. And eventually it gets bigger and bigger. But it's just the mere fact that it exists. It's probably 90 percent of it. And the, what's actually in it's probably 10 percent or so. And, and not very many people are actually going to unearth all that. It's just showing that you're the expert. Yeah. And that you put it all together, that you're professional, reliable. Absolutely. So, so I think there's, you know, there's, there's kind of this trend now and you just see, you see a lot of systems that are getting more and more complicated, more and more automated, which is nice. And the automation is supposed to save you all this manual labor, but setting up the automations isn't always that easy. And, you know, it, so these things start to get more and more complex. And what you're talking about is so much more of a less moving part, simple approach to it. So do you find that the clients that you're, you're, you're talking with, that you're building better relationships because of that? Do you think that's, that's the reason people are choosing you if, if we were to survey them? Oh, yeah. It's, it's like a breath of fresh air. Because with this way, you know, how, how we've all done it, all of us, all three of us at least, right? Um, we see a tool in, in the past and we say, wow, I wonder if I could sell that service, right? The tools are leading us as opposed to this is the plan. Now, what tools do we need to make this plan work? See, the, it, it's a reverse. That's why you hear people saying, what, what, email, what email service are you using? What landing page system are you using? What CMS are you using? All the focus is going on these tools as though the tools were going to give you this unfair advantage that you currently don't have or just cause the clouds to part and the sun to come out. Where the reality is, is that the, the ultimate tool is you. And basically you're pushing yourself and your, your, your message to the side in favor of using, you know, the tech, putting the technology first. Once we know what we're going to do, like if we're just going to use email as our primary communication tool for our restaurant that we're opening up, then we know that everything's going to be focused on getting the customers to come in to part with their name and email address, even if it means giving them a coupon, following up and asking them how the food was, letting them know that we're having a wine tasting coming up next month. And we're going to give away some prizes. Everything becomes focused and the technology starts to work for us instead of us just being distracted by the technology. When you don't know what you need, everything's a distraction because yeah. this may fit or that may fit. We don't know, you know, and being we're only one or two people, you know, as the primary uh, focus in the business, when we're doing one thing, we're not doing another. So at the most, you can wear two hats effectively. You know, you're, you're, you're not going to you're not going to be able to be like the jack of all trades and, and master much of anything. For sure. I did say we had a, a, a question in the group here that somebody said, so do I need to have a podcast? Uh, they also said, what if I sound like Frogger, which I think would make it super memorable. So I would definitely go with that. But I, I want Jim to answer this, too. And I, I would say my my instant thing would be 
you need to do what's comfortable for you, what makes sense for you, your message, your customers, uh, what you feel comfortable doing. But so how did you land on doing a podcast, Jim? Uh, you know, how, how did you end up with that being kind of your, your means of communicating? Well, I, I test everything because if you ask somebody what's right and what's wrong, everybody's right and everybody's wrong. It's just how it's going to work out for you. So um, for my significant other, uh, we tested a podcast for her first, and uh, now she has over 6 million downloads on it. And so through her through her podcast, I you know, I'm, I'm like a little mini weenie boy compared to yeah. <laughs> what she's doing, you know. So um, – and she's, oh, don't worry. You're just in a different niche than me. But anyway, um, <laughs> and not as interesting. We should have got her on. <laughs> what are we doing? I'm talking to you. So, uh, so I, yeah. So, you know, I tested there and I thought, okay, this is, this is the way to go. Um, I don't like being on camera really that much as I like just to be the voice because, you know, I'm super like, uh, I got to edit this and edit that. And it's just simpler uploading a MP3 than it is uploading an MP4. So that's where I decided to start with. And I did it for 10 months with like zero feedback. So, and that's what I was ready for. I was ready for hard. I prepared for a uphill all the way because everybody's distracted. Everybody's got a million and one other options. And so I realized nobody's going to hear me until they've heard me over and over and over again. And you can go online to like YouTube and see great content creators that just stopped. Mm -hmm. Why did they stop? Well, probably because they didn't get the response they were hoping for. So if that is, if I followed that pattern, I would have been done after six months, you know, but Nathan uh, Wrigley and um, those guys, they just, you know, they have a simple podcast, him and David, where they're just talking to people. And you guys have a simple podcast where you're talking to people. And I convinced myself that in the earlier days, man, I can't, I'm not that interesting. How am I going to come up with interesting things to, to talk about? I can't just talk. And then I realized that, hey, I can just talk. And, and people will listen. It's the topic. It's not me. You know, and that's what I was. I had reversed it. You know, I got to be interesting. How do I do that? Jeez, I'll get back to me in like eight months. Maybe I'll have an answer for you. <laughs> no, I think that I think that's solid advice. And you know, you just got to do two. You know, speaking to that, like, you know, you went how many ever months, probably feeling like you were just speaking into the dark and not hearing response. And I think part of it is you have to have that consistency. You have to be able to know that you can keep producing this content over and over and over uh, until you you like click in with a group or whoever you're trying to go after. But so I would say, you know, focus on something you know you can be consistent at doing. Maybe that's podcasting. Maybe that's doing videos. Maybe that's writing blogs. Maybe that's a really cool email list. Whatever that may be, just something that you feel comfortable doing, you know? Yeah, and yeah. on the topic of uh, time and uh, just kind of the weight, uh, especially when you're, you're first starting out. One of the things that when I onboard new clients, and I mean, like, not just new to me, but they're just starting their business, you know, they're, they're very green on all accounts. Um, I'm thinking about one in particular over and over. I've actually two, two, like this, this just is perfect for, you know, it's statistically two years, two to three years it takes for a business to become profitable. And the times or how many times I've said that to these two clients over and over and over again. And they're, they're calling me worrying about, you know, not something that's, that's marketing or not something that's, that's necessarily like web, web development or this, that, and the other thing. But like, you know, just calling me and saying like, Hey, like I'm getting nervous here. You know, I'm, I'm spending, you know, that, uh, that safety net, like, and all it, it's, it's all about sticking with it. You know, and yeah, there might be a failure there, but you, you don't know a hundred percent until you do, you know, yeah. and both of these clients, I'm happy to say that, uh, one last year and one this year, they've become profitable and they're, they're looking like they're going to continue to be profitable for, for a long time. That's great because if they're coming to you with these, they're looking for interaction from you. So they, they really appreciate you, obviously, and believe in you that to do that. I mean, that's really what everybody wants. You want to be more valuable than just, you know, the person that 
does you know the service that you provide you want to be seen as an asset more than a code uh, monkey yeah yeah and, and you got to realize too what you are is probably different to all of your clients you know if if you went and surveyed all your clients and said you know what does you know what does Kyle do for your business you, i would probably get a lot of different answers from all my different clients absolutely yeah. which is interesting so I, I do want to tell, you know, we mentioned your, your workshop several times in here. Why don't you tell us uh, how everybody can get signed up to check that out? Um, and so everybody can take part in that as well, Jim. Yeah, the, uh, the, the workshop, um, I'm going to give you the, the back door to the workshop so you don't actually have to sign up uh, to get it if you don't want to. If you do sign up, just know that you're not going to get hit with, uh, with a sales sequence, so... That's not my style. But anyway, it's at uh, jimgalliano.com slash workshop. And our last name is spelled G-A-L-I-A-N-O, jimgalliano.com. If you want to go right to the um, the main program, it's at jamesgalliano.com. But I encourage you to watch the workshop first because um, I didn't hold anything back in there. It's like 50 minutes long, and I went over every little detail that I could without doing it to death. And uh, – it, and how my my if you want to look at what I'm doing and, and the sales marketing wise, um, basically I have a one content thing that I focus on. It's a major thing that I do. That's like the podcast. I have the minor with like these little videos that I make, and I know that there a percentage of the people will want to work with me or or buy my whatevers, and it's as simple as that. And you can do it too once you once you. Um, see how it works. It's, it's very simple. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's it in a nutshell. I will say, go ahead and just go to jimgalliano.com and on the homepage, you can sign up there for the workshop, which puts you into his email list. And like you said, you're not going to get an autoresponder, but you are going to get some very wise words. I would say about once a week or so. A lot of times it comes on the weekend when my email is a little slow and I, I need some time to read. So the emails are fantastic. I usually uh, respond to Jim with applause on them. Um, Thank you. And, and bonus, if you listen to uh, the podcast and you heard this several times on this episode, is you're going to get boxing analogies nine times out of ten. So if you're into boxing in any way, you're definitely going to get those analogies uh, pulled out through all the episodes. Yeah, I, I, you know what? The, the whole, I don't know whether you want to call it coaching or consulting or, or whatever. It, I, I think it's the missing piece in, in business in general in making progress is people working with people because when you're alone, you're like in a vacuum, you know, there's nothing that you can't bounce your ideas off of people, your thoughts, your concerns, your worries. When, when you, when a client is able to work with you, when you're able to work with other people, all these uh, people bring things to the table that you're not going to get when you're, you know, when you're just doing everything by yourself. So for me, you know, I like, I enjoy listening to other uh, people's take on things. Cause everybody, I mean, even the person that's just starting out has something unique in their experience that they can share and you can benefit from. So there's a lot of value, um, that if you just, just listen, there's a lot of value, a lot of things you can pick up. There's no doubt about that. All right, guys. Well, before we, uh, we wrap this up, I definitely want to thank Jim for coming on the show. I'm, I've been super excited about this all week. So I appreciate you coming thank on you. And, and sharing your knowledge Brad. with us. Uh, I'll, I'll make sure to get all the links into the show notes uh, so you can check all that out. Again, I do want to say that next week we do have Matt Davies coming on and he's got something super exciting that's going to launch the morning he's on the show. So I'm really sticking it to him in this episode. If you're watching, Matt, uh, I'm putting the pressure on you. It's got to be ready because I've <laughs> announced it. And there's a million people listening to this podcast that are now waiting on you. So get it done, sir. Um, and Matt, do you have anything to add to that? No, no. I think that uh, we've summed it up well, and it's time to say goodbye. Awesome. Well, Jim, again, thank you so much. And as a reminder, if this group helps you in any way, the easiest way to help us is to share the content, subscribe to our show, and or use our affiliate links. It's all free. It takes little time, and it helps support the show. That is all for now. We will see you all inside the group. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Even the person that's just starting out has something unique 
in their experience that they can share and you can benefit from. 